I'd, li I'd just like to thank everyone for coming out tonight uh, on behalf of Wycliffe College and the Meeting House to our pub night. And uh, we're really pleased tonight to have a wonderful guest, Paul Franks, who's a professor of philosophy at Tyndale University College. Tonight's topic is evil. Uh, and so we're just uh, really privileged to have Paul here tonight, and we're looking forward to an interesting conversation. Paul's just uh, finished editing a new book called Explaining Evil Four Views, and tonight we're just going to have a little chat about how different people and different perspectives, uh, both Christian and atheistic, uh, look at this, the issue of evil, what it is, uh, what does it mean for us, and how do we explain it, and how do we make sense of it in our world I'm looking forward to this conversation. It was a good read. I'm sure you enjoyed writing about it. So, Paul, why don't you just uh, start off by telling a little bit about yourself, your journey, how you got here, kind of what brought you to your interest in this question of evil in writing this book. Yeah, sure. Well, it's, it's great to be here. Um, it's uh, always fun to, to get to do stuff with, with Wycliffe, and so thanks for, thanks for having me. Um, I'm uh, an American. I grew up in Oklahoma, and uh, I, it's... I, it's funny how some of these projects sort of have really long uh, histories, and I don't need to go into the details, <laughs> I don't need to give a long history, but uh, I first started thinking about, uh, about evil in general whenever I was taking a, a course at university uh, on the poetical books, and uh, one of the courses, one of my professors mentioned something about the book of Job, and then we start talking about evil in general, and then it just sort of was just sitting around in the back of my head and thinking about evil, and I remember writing a really terrible, I'm sure, uh, paper for a different course on theodicy uh, that, that year, and I've never quite screwed up the courage to reread it, uh, even though I, I guess I could. But, um, but it's sort of just been something that's been sitting with me. Um, then I, uh, when I was at, I, I did my, my doctoral studies at the University of Oklahoma, and whenever I was doing my, my coursework there, uh, I met with my advisor, uh, Linda Zagzebski, and we were just sort of talking about my, you know, sort of what I was going to work on uh, in the dissertation. And um, earlier in the, the year, I'd written a paper on the relationship between certain responses to the problem of evil, like the free will defense, and how you could, how can one fit a free will defense to the problem of evil with a, uh, a sort of a standard conception of original sin. I was trying to tease out some of the, the, the issues there. And she said, you know, this is a really, that was a really interesting paper. Why don't you sort of just take that and use that as a chapter for a dissertation and expand on it and then find some other Christian doctrines uh, that are connected to the free will defense in some, in some way uh, and do that for your dissertation. And I thought, that's amazing. That sounds like something I would love to do. And so, um, so then I, it was through working on that project that I, it got me thinking about the problem of evil more particular. And that's what, and this, this later thinking is what led to, to this book. Uh, I, I realized through uh, finishing the dissertation and then teaching courses, I've, several of my, my students uh, from Tyndale are here. Uh, I think most of you have taken my Problem of Evil course. Uh, through teaching the, uh, the course, I, it sort of occurred to me that I think there's, uh, has, a gap has grown in how we approach the problem of evil. You know, if God is all powerful and good and uh, loving and uh, all knowing, like, why would that type of being allow there to be evil? Or surely evil counts against God's existence. Uh, so, whenever we think about that problem, it, it occurred to me that there was sort of a, a gap had grown where um, what often happened was uh, you would have a theist who would say, you know, espouse some belief, some sort of uh, understanding of God, and then an atheist would come along and say, well, what about evil? And then the theist's response was aimed at sort of putting down that problem, like dealing with that problem, but I, I realize a lot of times that they may, they may have successfully responded to the problem without ever really saying, why is there evil? Like they say things like, well, you're, the problem you've raised has these various difficulties in the problem itself, and so you have a problem with your problem, and then they never say why there is evil. And um, that was the first sort of gap that I noticed, is that a lot of times the responses don't actually amount to, here's why I think there is evil. Um, the second one, uh, and, th and, and that was addressed in, the, in the, this book as well, is that the, the nature of the dialogue often doesn't provide much occasion for the non-theist to say, why is there evil? Um, it's usually just, you 
Christian theists in particular, most often there's some problem for, uh, for evil on your account. Um, but then the non-theist never has to say why there is evil on their view or how they make sense of it. And so um, I wanted to address both of those things in this book. And so that's why uh, there's two Christians who have contributed to it and two atheists, so that both uh, contributors or all four contrib contributors, both sides, have an opportunity to say, here's why I think there is evil. Uh, and it's outside of the context of trying to respond to a problem. It's just saying, why is there evil? Um, I'm sure some of you are doing the work in historical theology. This is, I think, more in line with what Augustine was doing in his response to the problem of evil, where he wasn't necessarily saying, um, there's, you know, there's this evil thing out there. How do we make sense of it? Uh, or like, doesn't that count against God's existence? Instead, he's just saying like, look, we know God exists. So how do we make sense of evil in light of God's existence? And that, I think, actually, that sort of approach is actually quite, quite useful. And so both of the Christian uh, contributors, uh, Richard Davis, uh, a colleague of mine at Tyndale, and Paul Helm, um, both of their approaches sort of, they, they take that account. Like, look, we, we know there's God, so how, how do we fit evil within that? And uh, obviously the atheists don't take that same starting point, uh, but they, they do want to try to figure out how to make sense of evil, given what they do take to be true. Great. Yeah. Yeah, why don't, why don't we like walk through these four views just so we can kind of pr provide a foundation sure. for everybody as to the landscape of this conversation. Okay. And we can kind of go through and order uh, each of them and kind sure. of give an overview of that position and, and how they kind of... Do you have a preference for which order or just uh, the what's order your preference? of the book? Go, or? Go, yeah, whatever preference you, you okay. have. Yeah. We'll just go in the order of the book, uh, which I was at my creative best and chose alphabetical order. Uh, and so, uh, well, so um, the first uh, chapter was written by uh, Richard Davis, again, a co colleague of mine. Uh, and he takes uh, an approach that's uh, very much sort of, uh, if you're thinking about it theologically, on more of an Arminian side of things, where his, his strategy was to say, look, um, when we look around, we know that evil exists. We see evil actions. We see uh, people doing evil things. What conditions need to be met in order for those things to actually be evil, for there to be really evil. What, what has to be true of reality in order for us to appropriately say this particular thing or that particular thing was evil? And so one of, there, there's a couple of things that he, he picked out. Um, first is that um, you have to have conscious human agents. So if you don't have a, a world with conscious, uh, conscious agents, um, you don't have evil because evil involves an intentional decision to bring about wrongdoing. Uh, with no overriding purpose for it, right? It's an intentional uh, attempt to harm someone significantly without any overriding reason. Uh, and so in order for that to happen, you have to have people who are actively choosing to do that. Um, so you have to have conscious agents, uh, and these conscious agents ha they have to have uh, a significant type of free will. So some of you may be familiar with uh, some of the debates in free will, but there's sort of two broad camps. Uh, one is what we call a libertarian conception of free will. The other is a compatibilist account of free will. Uh, so uh, a compatibilist account of free will would say that free, there is free will and free will is compatible with being determined, right? So you're free whenever you do what you want to do, right? So as long as you're doing what you want to do, you're free. The libertarian says it's, it's more than that. You, you also have to be uh, free to form your wants as well. Um, and so he's on, on uh, uh, Rich's account, you have to have conscious agents who have this libertarian freedom. Because if, if you don't have that, um, then you don't have truly genuine free choice. Um, and so then the rest of his chapter is sort of saying, here's two competing accounts where you can't make sense of that. Uh, so one is uh, Calvinistic Christianity. Uh, he doesn't think uh, satisfies the libertarian freedom account of things. So if, uh, on his view, if Calvinism is true, uh, there is no evil. Um, and then the other account is uh, sort of a, a Darwinian naturalism. So, uh, on Darwinian naturalism, uh, you actually don't have the room to make account of uh, conscious agents. Like, uh, he gives a, a story of why evolution can't uh, give an account of why there are, sorry, Darwinian evolution can't spell out consciousness. And so that sets aside uh, two major comp competitors. And, and then it says, however, when you look at uh, the details of things, uh, the requirements that uh, need to be met in order for there to be evil, Christian theism uh, meets quite nicely, right? God is a conscious agent, and so it wouldn't be surprising for him to create individuals that at least share some of those uh, attributes, uh, and he has endued us with the power of, of choice. And so 
Uh, so why is there evil? Well, uh, surprisingly to some uh, atheists, why is there evil? Well, because God exists. Um, and God has created us in this sort of way where we can uh, exercise this sort of ability. And kind of the draw of that position is it kind of absolves God to some extent as to yeah. why there's evil in the world. It's because yeah. of the freedom that people have. Is, is yeah, I, I think that's right. I think that is, that is part of the motivation. Um, I think many people who take it different views would probably say it doesn't do enough. It doesn't do a good enough job of absolving God. Like he's still on the hook because he set everything up in in the first place. Uh, but I think that's part of it is to be able to say, uh, look, we we can retain this belief that God is holy, good, morally perfect. Um, and if God is holy, good, morally perfect, then it's probably going to you may have a hard time figuring out how he's the explanation for something like evil, given that evil seems to be opposed to moral goodness. Uh, and so part of Rich's account is a way of, of, of being able to say, here's why we have evil, but it doesn't end up being God's fault. Um, and again, that that's often will be a, a point of uh, contention of whether or not uh, you can drive that wedge uh, fully enough in between the two. But yeah, that's part of it. Great. And so the second chapter kind of takes the other flip of the Christian yeah. position yeah. and deals more with the Calvinist understanding. So why yeah. don't you... Yeah. You know, share a little bit about that. Sure. Yeah, so um, Paul Helms, uh, he, again, he wrote the second chapter. If you're not familiar with him, he's a really, really prominent uh, Calvinist uh, uh, theologian, philosopher. Uh, and his approach is uh, a version of what you could call the, the Felix Culpa approach to theodicy. And so this is something, it's, it's got uh, medieval antecedents, but uh, the philosopher Alvin Plantinga has made it more prominent more, more recently. Uh, and basically, it's, uh, so Felix Culpa is something like a happy accident or happy fault. And um, on, on Helm's view, he says, look, the, the, again, um, this wouldn't be, a, I don't think this would be the way he would approach presenting his chapter if it was that standard, what's your solution to the problem of evil? Uh, but again, he's starting with his, his conception of there is a God, so how do, we, how do we fit evil within it? So he says, well, we know that there is a God, we know that God is sovereign, uh, and so things must be arranged according to his good pleasure, right? So the world as we see it there's a, there's a reason for it being that way. Namely, it's how God designed the world to be. Um, and so in some way, then there has to be a, a, a divine purpose or intention for there to be things like evil. Um, because it, if it wasn't according to God's good pleasure for there to be evil, given his sovereignty, there wouldn't be evil, right? So what is that? Well, this is where, what, what, what are those purposes? And this is where that, that Felix Culpa strategy comes in. And uh, so here, this is sort of a combination of Helm and Plantinga. I sometimes get confused of who said what uh, at this point. But uh, I mean, Helm rightfully and, and says, look, this is, I'm, I'm borrowing from Plantinga here. Um, so the idea is, um, if you look at, if you think about all of the ways the world could have gone, right? So in the actual world, we know that there was a fall and the fall had a calamitous uh, effect on all of, all of reality. It created a division between humans and God. It brought about sin and death and all sorts of, like it, it was this major event. Um, well, if you think about all of the other ways that the world could have gone, one of the things you'll recognize, you'll see, is that all of the worlds where there are atonement and the second person of the Trinity becomes incarnate, it is incarnate, walks the flesh, it like gives himself up freely on our behalf. When you think about all of the worlds that include an incarnation and an atonement, all of those worlds are really, really valuable and really great worlds because it has this beautiful, magnificent story of divine sacrifice. Um, so according to the, the, the Felix Culpa theodicy, all of the very, very best worlds are worlds that include incarnation and atonement because the good of incarnation and atonement is so great. What that means then is if you have a world with no incarnation and atonement, it's that world is going to be worse off than worlds that have incarnation and atonement. Well, here's how this connects to why God would arrange the world to have evil. If you have no evil, you have no need for incarnation and atonement. So strangely enough, all of the worlds that, so again, think back, how could the world, like, you know, if Adam hadn't sinned, and no one after him had sinned either, apparently. Um, and there was no sin at all. You might think, well, if there's no sin, there's no suffering, there's no evil, that's a really good world, right? And it would be a good world, but it wouldn't be as good as a world that has sin, but also has incarnation and atonement. 
So how is it that uh, a, a, a world with sin in it could be something that's uh, arranged according to God's good pleasure? Well, that very sin is what occasions the great good of Christ being incarnate and atoning for us, restoring us, having the, the, the story of redemption come about. So it's, it's a totally different way of approaching from, from Davis, um, uh, you know, but it's, uh, you know, he, he, the way he spells it out is, is very much in, in line and consistent with his, his, uh, his, uh, his Calvinism. Um, you know, and some people find that plausible, others, others don't, but... Uh, yeah, I think the, the two things that struck me in that chapter, uh, one was that incarnation and atonement isn't a plan B. You know, it's, yeah. a, it's a plan A, yeah. you know, because it is the best. Whereas some Arminian, you know, perspectives, it kind of feels like yeah. it's, a, it's an afterthought. Like, oh, you know, I like, got to fix it, you know. <laughs> um, uh, so I think that yeah. struck me. The other thing that struck me in that chapter was, uh, for Helm, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, it seems as though evil doesn't have an ontology of its own. Right. It, it is a privation of the good, yeah, yeah. you know, and, and that's a little bit different than some of the other perspectives in some ways yeah. as well. So could you kind of expand on that idea yeah. of the, or the privation sure. of good and how that yeah, so, defines so, evil? Yeah, so Helm uh, is, is relying on Augustine here, who's uh, famous for talking about, you know, that e evil doesn't have an existence all, all on its own, right? So um, the way I explain it to my first-year students at Tyndale, which they, I don't know if they remember or not, but um, is, uh, so over here on this table, we have uh, various delicious donuts, uh, and in the middle, there are donut holes, right? So we're not talking about the Timbits that you go and buy, like the actual hole, the part that's missing, right? You say, well, what, what is a donut hole? Like, what's the ontology of the hole there? Can you, could you just go over and get me a hole? Well, no, you couldn't bring me a hole. You would have to bring me a donut with part of it missing, right? Well, um, that's very much Augustine's way of thinking about what evil is, is that evil doesn't exist all on its own any more then the hole in the middle of that donut exists all on its own. Or, um, so one of the things he says is, you know, like, uh, you don't have, uh, you, don't, you don't create coldness, right? You, you remove heat, right? And so coldness doesn't exist all on its own. Well, that's the way evil is as well. And so um, one of the, the motivations for that, both in Augustine and then Helm picks up on this, is that if evil doesn't exist all on its own, you don't have to give an account for why God would create it. Because it doesn't exist. God didn't create it. It doesn't exist. Instead, what you have are instances where you should have goodness to some degree, and some of the goodness that should be there is missing. And that's what we call evil. Now, um, some have, and Helm doesn't do this, but just to kind of clarify, some have tried to use that response just as a solution to the problem of evil and say, there is no problem because there is no evil, right? You just have privations of goodness. But the thoughtful atheist uh, objector is likely to just slightly reword their problem of, instead of calling it the problem of evil, they're going to call it the problem of privations of goodness, and then you've got the same problem. So that alone <laughs> isn't going to solve anything, but it is helpful to make sure that you're not, at least on Helm's view, that he's not committing himself to anything more than, um, more than what he's willing to, to, to admit has sort of an ontological status, and right. evil doesn't any more than a hole does or the window in, a, in a, a wall or a door in a wall does. Those sorts of things require something else in order to exist, uh, and so does evil. It requires some goodness, and then some of that goodness has to be missing. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's funny you bring up the donut holes. That's what my, one of my favorite comedians calls it the great paradox, that like when you remove that piece, the thing that you remove is the donut hole, but what it leaves behind is also the donut yeah, hole. Yeah, that's you know, right. like yeah. it's just like, <laughs> which one's the donut hole? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, great. <laughs> so, uh, so then we move on to Michael Roos, who's a, yeah. a Darwinian uh, yeah. philosopher, atheist, yeah. or agnostic, yeah. agnostic-ish atheist. Yeah, uh, yeah. He, uh, he says he's agnostic about an other thing in general, but he's an atheist about, like, Christianity. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, that God certainly doesn't exist. Maybe something else. I don't Who knows? Yeah. I mean, I, so he's, he kind of treats himself as an atheist in these kinds of discussions, yeah. but I don't, he's not, I don't think, a really, a, truly, fully an, an atheist. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, so why don't you kind of uh, flesh sure. out his perspective on evil? Yeah, so it was funny whenever I was reading the, in the initial chapters and everybody submitted their chapters, and I read Rich's chapter, because he kind of had in his initial chapter, a little mini section against what he knew Helm was going to say, just because he's familiar with his work. And then another section in his chapter against what he knew Ruse was going to say, because he was familiar with his work. And I was like, 
as the editor, should I tell him that he's kind of cheating? Uh, and so I decided not. I decided to just leave it. Nobody complained about it, so that's good. But uh, so, so Ruse is a, a really well-known philosopher of science uh, down in uh, Florida, and um, his approach is vastly different. And so not only does he have a different approach on the uh, theism question, right, of being an atheist, or at least in this context, an atheist, um, but he also has a different approach to what evil is. And so one of the first lines in his chapter is something like, let me say really you know, clearly, uh, I believe there is evil, that there are evil actions. Uh, and then he spends the rest of the chapter trying to square his belief that there is evil with his claim, uh, both in this book and in lots of other uh, places, that uh, morality has no objective foundation to it. So uh, Ruse, you could say, is a, a moral skeptic, you might say is another way of putting it, where he, he thinks that there, is, uh, there are moral claims and there is a morality, uh, but it is wholly unobjective. And, and, and it doesn't, that, he's not like a relativist. Uh, instead, he, he says he wants to ground his conception of morality in general, evil in particular, in a, an evolutionary story. And so the, the way he, he sort of unpacks it is he, he says, look, um, there's different ways that species evolve, right? There's, you have different strategies for that, that species adopt for survival. So some strategies, uh, like the ants, it's just the, 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 the whole purpose is just create a whole lot of offspring. That gives you the best chance for your genes to be continued on, right? Just tons and tons of offspring. Um, Humans, however, take a different approach, right? Uh, where it's fewer offspring, but a lot more care is given to those offspring. And that care, uh, this, the uh, species that take this approach to evolutionary survival, um, that care ends up being shared as well. Uh, so it's not just by, from a uh, parent to, to the uh, direct offspring, but it's also a communal thing as well. And so what happens is he says uh, something to the effect of nature sort of gives us a shove in the direction of caring for others. And, and so uh, this is where he talks about uh, the role of uh, altruism on, on his view. It's, it's not altruism like you might normally think of just doing something for the sake of somebody else and not uh, benefiting. It's not that sort of thing. It, instead of what he means by altruism is uh, it's a, a recognition that whenever I uh, treat others in a particular way, it's actually good for me and for my own survival as well. And so morality, that's really what morality amounts to. So what happens is whenever one chooses to do what's not altruistic, that's where immorality arises from. And depending on the degree, it may even arise to being something like being called evil. Um, what uh, I think was the biggest point of contention in his chapter among the other three contributors. So in the book, so they each wrote their own chapter and then all, three, they, all of them responded to each other. And so it's kind of like a four-way debate. Uh, and the, the main point of contention, I think, by, from the other three contributors when they were reflecting on Ruse's chapter was uh, this, uh, this account of morality that's completely unobjective and is solely dependent upon the evolutionary story that he tells is that uh, it amounts to evil not really being objective at all uh, in any way. And so, uh, and, and he, he's okay with that. So he says things like, uh, look, the way we have evolved, the way the human uh, species has evolved, uh, that within our system, sex with small children is evil. But we could have evolved differently. And had we have evolved differently, it wouldn't have been evil. Uh, and so there's a really funny line from uh, Wielenberg, the fourth contributor, where he says, you know, uh, Ruse says he believes in evil, but, you know, uh, the reader may be excusably confused by that, given that he doesn't believe in evil. Uh, and then Ruse uh, comments on that in his final reply and doesn't take too kindly to that. He's like, news to me! A big exclamation point. Um, but, uh, and the reason Wielenberg sort of responds in that way is because um, on, on the way he's sort of thinking it is that um, if you don't have objectivity, if it's not truly evil, if there's not something making it evil, if it's just how, it, that things that we say are evil, they should still be evil even if we had evolved in different ways. And on Ruse's account, he just says that's not the case. Um, and so on his view, why is there evil? Well, because sometimes people choose. So his account of choosing is different from Rich Davis's. It's more in that comp compatibilist line where you're choosing to do what you want, but you could be determined to do what you want by uh, prior events. Um, but if somebody chooses to act contrary to uh, this evolutionarily given account of altruism, 
well, that's, that's evil. So why is there evil? Well, some people choose to not do what they have been sort of programmed to do by evolution. Right. And I think for me, what was lacking in that chapter was there was not a, a strong account of culture and mm. cultural evolution and in mm. different cultures. Yeah. And I guess he didn't have time also to deal with yeah, that. But yeah. Uh, um, yeah. Well, he's got like 90 books, so he probably says something about sure. it somewhere. Yeah. Uh, but uh, <laughs> uh, he, yeah, you're right. He doesn't, he doesn't bring that up, yeah. bring that up here. Um, but um, yeah, did you, and then, uh, sir, do you want me to say, move on to Willenberg? Or? Yeah, let's yeah. move on to okay. Willenberg. And I found that the most unexpected chapter. Yeah. It was really jarring in, yeah. in, in the approach. It was interesting. Right. And so, so, so the, the fourth yeah. chapter is written by uh, Eric Willenberg. Um, and uh, in his chapter, he, he, I think he probably has the most novel approach uh, to this, this question. Um, he, he sort of starts off and he says, whenever we, so like Ruse, he, he grounds his chapter in a broader account of just morality in general. He says, so how do we think about morality in general? And then let's see how that applies to thinking about evil in particular. Um, and so in Wielenberg's account, he says, look, whenever people try to figure out what the heck is going on with these moral claims, um, uh, if you, unlike Ruse, if you think that there is an objective morality, that there's something that makes actions morally right and morally wrong, and it's not just individuals or it's not cultures, and it truly is wrong all of an, uh, on its own or, or right all on its own, um, if there is that, the, the, often the times uh, people try to give an account or an explanation for that objectivity in one of two ways. They either try to, and this is what he says, this is, you know, sort of one is the theistic route, where you try to say moral properties are sort of grounded in God in some way, right? So some people do that with uh, divine command theory of ethics. Others will do it like uh, in more of a natural law theory, it, it, given how God's created us. There's a lot of different ways you do it. But in some way, one way or the other, moral properties are grounded in God and who God is and his way of creating or his way of commanding or something to that effect. So that's one way of talking about objective morality. The other way is uh, by grounding moral properties in some other natural thing, right? So you have uh, various other natural properties, and when they come together in a certain way, uh, some accounts will say moral properties emerge from these natural properties. So you have a theistic grounding for objective morality or a non-theistic or a naturalistic account of, of objective morality. What's, so, and there's lots of people that have done that. What's novel about Wielenberg's approach is he says both of those accounts are wrong. Instead, moral properties are wholly unique, uh, sui generis. They're wholly unique. They're not grounded in, in uh, a theistic God. They're not grounded in natural properties either. They just exist as part of the fabric of reality. Uh, so um, the property of being evil is a property that just exists. Um, the more he talks about it, the more people start thinking about like platonic forms. Right, so Plato has these forms that exist, justice and courage and beauty and these sorts of things, uh, and they exist even if nothing else exists. Well, these moral properties on Wielenberg's account have a similar feel to them, that these moral properties, whether it's being evil or being morally good, these things exist, and what happens is um, certain actions or events that occur in reality cause these properties to be instantiated or to be brought about, right? So if someone intentionally harms someone else for fun, just for the sake of it, uh, that's an action that will cause the property, the moral property, being evil to be brought about, to be instantiated. And so uh, to give an, a, to sort of, um, the way he tries to give an account of this in a way that many of you may be familiar with is he says, look, um, you might think it's weird to think about these moral properties just sort of existing as brute. Like there, there's no explanation for them. There's no account. They're just there. Um, he says, but that's really what theists say about God, right? If somebody says, well, why does God exist? And, you know, there's different ways you might try to respond to that. Um, some probably better than others. Uh, but at some point or another, many people who uh, answer the question, why does God exist? They're going to say, well, God is a necessary being. He has to exist. There are, there's no possible worlds in which he fails to exist. He just exists. He has to. He exists according to the necessity of his own nature. Um, well, Wielenberg says, the theists appeal to God existing just by brute. Well, I'm, I'm saying these moral properties exist just brute. They, there's no explanation for them. And so he says, look, it's not that different from what theists are doing. So he's sort of trying to say, don't think I'm too weird on you here. Um, and um, 
Yeah, so I mean that's that's the the the, the gist of his of his account. They, he he then wants to try and uh, go through a bit more. He he makes some other appeals to uh, how this isn't all that different from certain views in um, uh, philosophy of mind. You might think that uh, uh, con certain conscious properties just exist, um, and that that's consistent with your naturalism. And he tries to give an account about how uh, his account of moral properties exist. So he's trying to say, look, my view is not that strange from these other kinds of views, either for theists or non-theists. Uh, but it is a, a unique approach. Yeah. yeah. And he had a, a big chunk of his chapters on dehumanization, yeah, right? Uh, yeah. And just the role that plays in yeah. bringing about evil. Why don't you talk a little sure. bit about that? And uh, yeah, I thought that was really interesting that he sort of took it in that direction. So uh, near the, the the probably the second half, close to the second half of his chapter, he starts talking about what dehumanization is, and he gives an account of how whenever when you go through and you look at various uh, instances of true something being truly evil, what you see is, um, you know, whether it's the Holocaust or whether it's any other genocide from any other country, um, whatever, it, you, we look at these things, what you see is that uh, individuals began to treat others as being less than human. Slavery was a good example. Um, so there's something, some other, something other than being human. And whenever you begin to dehumanize one another, what that does is it allows you sort of the headspace to, to, to treat them less than human, which is the very thing that brings about things like evil. So he doesn't say anywhere in the book or, um, or in his chapter that all accounts of evil are instances of dehumanization. Um, though he does, obviously with, does think the reverse is true, that dehumanization is, all accounts of dehumanization or instances of dehumanization are evil. Uh, but he said, so there, there could be other types of evil or other uh, kinds of evil other than dehumanization, but he thinks that that actually accounts for a large uh, 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 um, majority of what we th see as being evil. Is it, it stems from someone being dehumanized or a group of people being dehumanized. Uh, 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 and so, um, you know, yeah, uh, that's, I mean, is there... Yeah, no, yeah, I, yeah. I just think it was an interesting yeah, yeah. Uh, kind of example of what yeah, he was yeah, trying to get the, at. Yeah, that's the way of thinking about it, yeah. is it's a, It was just sort of an, ex an extended account of how his theory looks in practice yeah. uh, using that particular account. Right. So there could be other types of evil as well, um, and he would presumably think it works the same way. Yeah. So in undertaking a project like this, uh, you obviously started with a certain knowledge about this issue. Yeah how did you grow through this process in reading and yeah. interacting with the different authors? And did your views change or, or modify in any way? Or were they uh, kind of yeah. crystallized in certain aspects? Um, so I think of the four views uh, in the book, I'm probably most sympathetic to uh, Rich Davis's account. Um, like we share a lot of similar background beliefs, but I had never uh, really put it together in that way where the need for uh, conscious agents of a certain sort is, is a requirement for evil. I just never really thought of it in that, that particular way. Um, but, you know, because we worked together, um, I was hearing a lot of his ideas, like, as he was writing it. And so it wasn't like, from reading the book, I was like, oh, wow, that's, so it's kind of a more of a slowly rolling out, uh, you know, whenever uh, students know that if they can't find me in the office, they should just go to Rich's office because I'll probably be in there. Uh, and so, um, but uh, the, so there, that, that was really just interesting how he packaged together this particular argument. Um, and he uses a lot of uh, Clark, Samuel Clark, um, in doing so, I'm, I'm not overly familiar with that much at all. Uh, and so that was, that was kind of interesting. Um, the, the thing, I, the um, Eric Wielenberg's chapter, I thought was really interesting. And if I weren't a Christian, if I, or if I weren't a theist of, uh, more broadly, uh, I would probably want to try to get myself to think that something like what Wielenberg offers is true. Because it, it does seem to, to do the right sort of work, and it's, I think it, it um, avoids other kinds of problems. Um, what was interesting is as, uh, and I don't think it was in response to it, but it certainly confirmed other things that I was working on, where um, there's a certain strategy that sometimes people in, um, that do Christian apologetics will employ, where uh, whenever they're presented with the problem of evil, we'll try and turn it on its head and turn the problem of evil into a moral argument for God's existence, right? So um, some of you are shaking your head. You've, you've either done this or are familiar with this, uh, right? So the idea is uh, you think that evil is a problem. Well, on your worldview, how do you explain evil at all? 
right? You, you can only explain evil if there is a God, so evil isn't a problem for God. It's actually best explained by God or only explained by God. Uh, and as, as um, right, I was working on a different project uh, as well while Eric was writing his chapter where I was starting to think maybe um, I was having less confidence in the success of that strategy of, this, of these moral arguments for God. I started to think more and more that maybe there would be, there would be ways for atheists to respond, to avoid uh, that, that conclusion. And then uh, Wielenberg delivers me his chapter and I'm like, yes, and this is one way. <laughs> uh, Wielenberg, had, the moral argument doesn't, doesn't phase Wielenberg at all. And so that was really kind of uh, eye-opening. Um, on a more humorous note, the, the thing that I, was most surprising to me was uh, in Michael Ruse's response to Rich Davis, um, how open he was about, uh, apparently, um, in the 70s, his, uh, he had an affair with his colleague's spouse because his colleague first had an affair with his spouse. And so I guess uh, the philosophy departments were different in the 70s. And he sort of just goes into all, I'm like, am I reading TMZ or is this my book? Like, what's yeah. all this stuff doing in here? Uh, and so that was really interesting. And uh, so that was uh, not the most philosophically interesting uh, point of it. But, um, but there was just, a, a, it was interesting on his view or just his approach to, to philosophy is, um, especially the bits about um, things like sex with small children being, evil, but only because of our moral system. Like he's, uh, many people might use that as sort of a way of saying, you know, if your view is right, then there could be worlds in which uh, humans having sex with small children is not evil. And therefore your view is wrong. Like that seems to be a, a pretty common way somebody might reason. Uh, and he just says, no, that's just a consequence of my view. Like he's pretty open with that. Yeah. Uh, so that was, that was surprising that these sorts of uh, ways that you might try and argue against his view but sort of like try to present a reductio ad absurdum or something. He just sort of says, no, that's just a consequence of my view. That's not a problem for me at all. Um, so yeah, so each, each author had kind of a unique way of approaching that sort of was, was really enlightening. That's uh, part of the value of getting, you know, all, all four contributors are full professors and have written tons. And so they all have interesting things to say, right. whatever you ask them to talk about. And so uh, it worked out really nicely. Right. And so, uh, uh, yeah, I guess the, coming back to that idea of um, Christians often present a certain case uh, for the moral argument or moral uh, argument for the existence of God. Yeah. I think like one of the things that was really cool about this book and I think is important as people from any worldview interact with people from another worldview is trying to uh, gain a sympathetic mm. reading of that yeah. other person's perspective. Yeah. And I think that really came through in the book. And um, do you feel like that kind of yeah. was was modeled by the the speakers and, and well, it, I, I'm glad to hear uh, you, you say that because that was certainly one of the things that I wanted to happen. Yeah. You know, and so you can have a you know you can have a plan or an idea and then not know how it's going to actually fall you know uh, flush itself out. Um, and I, th that was one of the main reasons why I wanted to have Ruse and Wielenberg is because I, I knew what a lot of Christians say about the problem of evil. You know, wrote a dissertation on it, right? Um, but I often would find myself having to kind of piece together what atheists might say about the problem of evil or about evil in general. Um, and so it was really helpful to have an opportunity to just say, why do you say there is evil? And then they give you an account of it and you can read it firsthand. And it's, you know, uh, one of the things that we, at, uh, that Rich and I both try to teach our students is to read other authors charitably, right? Read them in a way that uh, makes it more likely for their view to work than less likely, right? right? To be as charitable as we can. But um, whenever it comes to something like evil and its relationship to God or, or, or not, um, it could be really hard to be as charitable as one ought to be whenever you're trying to sort of piece together what somebody who has a wholly different worldview would say about this important question. And so, uh, so I certainly was hoping that this would provide an opportunity for each of the people to have their own opportunity to... to outside the context of the problem of evil, just to say, here's what I think about evil, given my worldview, and then have in that same, you know, the same book an opportunity for that to be examined and tested and prodded uh, with replies as well, you know, so that I let each of, the, uh, each of the authors got the last word in their own chapter, you know. Right. Um, and so you could see that it, it kind of keeps everybody honest if you know that they're going to also get a reply in print after you, yeah. you, you, you object to their views, right? Um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that, it's, uh, that other people agree with that reading. Uh, 
So after the project, did you feel like, oh, it really should have been a six views book or a seven views book? Like what, um, what weren't you able to, to cover in the book and, and what pieces are missing? Well, uh, yeah, the one, well, there's two, one more glaring difference. And, and, uh, and that is everybody's writing from a Western perspective. Uh, and so I don't have anybody from a non-Western perspective, whether it's Indian or Chinese. Uh, there's, you know, but uh, I just know nothing about Chinese philosophy or Indian philosophy, and so I didn't know who to go ask or if what they would say is helpful in this sort of discussion. Um, and so that was one, one thing. The, the other, and I'm not so sure, I thought uh, the, the, so there's two Christians and two atheists, um, and I was thinking of trying to find a Catholic uh, philosopher to write, but then that was gonna sort of weigh the Christians more heavily, and so then I thought, well, if I get a, another Christian perspective, I'll have to go find another unique atheistic or agnostic perspective, and I'm not sure what that would be. And then I started thinking about, well, knowing what Helm's probably gonna say, or the view, that might be pretty, Catholic as well, like it may, maybe they would say the same kind of thing, so I didn't know if it'd be worth the trouble, and so I'm still not so sure if uh, I should have had a couple more views or not. Uh, I think it would have been interesting to have a non-Western perspective, just to kind of see, and it would have been an opportunity for me to, to learn more about how they, how they would approach it, um, but I, I suspect that somebody could uh, write another four views uh, uh, explaining evil book from a non-Western perspective and have lots of other views, uh, but I just didn't think I was uh, qualified to to try and bring that in, but, you know. Cool. Well, thanks for sharing a little bit about no, that. Sure. We want to open up for some audience Q&A. Uh, if you have any questions uh, about the book or about evil or how to approach these questions or conversations, uh, feel free to ask. Uh, Terry's got a mic uh, if anybody wants to venture out. Well, it's not so much of a question. It's more of a comment based on Wheelingbrook because he is the most innovative or well, the, the most unique in his uh, uh, pursuit of the explain evil. Um, with his justification of saying that, well, if Christians can appeal to God as a necessary self-existing being, well, then I can appeal to these moral properties as existing on their, on their own. But they're both blue facts. My problem with that view is to say that he's conflating of the reason why Christians appeal to God in the first place, which mm. is to say that God is the ultimate source for why anything exists and why they continue to exist. Mm -hmm. Whereas properties, most philosophers will acknowledge that properties don't have that causal powers. Yeah. So unless Willenberg is going to affirm that moral properties also have causal powers to bring into, bring into existence certain things, I don't yeah. think that appeal is going to fly. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. And so there, you seem to be pointing out that there's a dip. So God not only exists sort of according to the necessity of his own nature, but he also has causal powers. Uh, and in fact, those causal powers is what explains everything else is existing, right? Whereas uh, these moral properties don't. And I think what he would say, uh, these moral properties don't have those, those causal powers. I think what Wielenberg would say is something like this. Um, I think you would say, I, uh, I'm not suggesting that these are equivalent things. What I'm saying is explanations have to stop somewhere. And so for the theist, you say, why are there moral properties? And you get an explanation for the moral property, God. You say, but what's the explanation for God's existence? And then the explanation stops, right? It's, it's God just has to exist. And so uh, for him, you just don't go back to God. You have these moral properties that just exist on their own. Uh, and so... Why? So, it, and it's it's not like he's. Um, I don't think he's saying. Well, look, they did it, so I can do it too. I think it more goes like this. He's not saying theists make this move, so I can make it as well. I think the account goes more like this. Um, here's my account, and it shares this similarity with theism, in that it's it, it doesn't have a a further explaining any any further explanation that's available. Uh, so it's not sort of like, uh, well, if they can do it, what could I think of that could get me away, give me my explanation uh, or my account and not have to do anything beyond that? And so it's sort of, um, I think he thinks there are real problems, um, independent of his atheism, uh, for theistic accounts of morality, right? I guess if you, if you think that only theism can give an account of morality and you're an atheist, you got a problem for <laughs> morality. Um, but he actually thinks that even on theism, that theism has, a pro has various problems doing the work it needs to do to give an account of moral properties. 
And he also thinks that naturalism all on its own, uh, where you have uh, moral properties being reducible to other natural properties, that has a bunch of difficulties that aren't resolvable either. Um, so maybe the problem is just trying to reduce moral properties to something else. And what if they're just not reducible? They just exist all on their own. And so I think that's sort of the strategy is to say these, you have problems with these, you got a problem with these, but maybe the very problem is trying to reduce it to something else. It just exists all on its own. But hey, guess what? That sounds weird, but other people are doing the same kind of thing. It's not that, so it's, it's just, uh, but I don't think in making that move, he's trying to say everything that's true of your brute existing thing, God, is also true of my brute existing thing, moral properties. And he's just saying they share a common feature. There's no further explanation available. And I so, think like monotheistic yeah. worldviews have a tendency to unify everything to yeah. a single Right. being or essence, right? Yeah. And like some platonic forms or other dualist or other types yeah. of cosmologies allow for, you know, more, you know, right, spreading right. out of, of... Right, whereas uh, on, yeah. on most accounts of theism, yeah. all of those other things do exist, but they all... Unify back get to... Get back to because of God, right? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, and so, yeah, so Wielenberg, um, you know, that's uh, what some people might think is a disadvantage to his view over theism is that uh, he's going to have a lot of different explanations that aren't unified in any way, whereas theism, you have, you know, you're, you're positing one hypothesis or one, one idea, pardon me, one idea, uh, and that one idea is doing a whole lot of explaining. It's quite uh, uh, grand in its And that's scope. kind of yeah. what causes the problem of evil in the first place, yeah, is that yeah. God is all-powerful right, and right. all-good, and yeah. then the results are... Right, so given that, yeah. how, why do we yeah, have these how can we yeah. deal with that conflict? How do you personally think about um, people who are going through suffering, experiencing yeah. evil, and yeah. they're struggling with the problem of divine hiddenness? Yeah. Not only why does God allow the evil, but yeah. once they're going through it, where is he yeah. when they're suffering? And it feels like God's just not there to help, which yeah. kind of makes the evil, like makes yeah. everything a hundred times worse. Yeah, that's good. Um, so the way I usually approach uh, approach these kinds of questions is, um, so far, whenever we, to the extent we have talked about the problem of evil, it's been very much sort of the philosophical or intellectual problem. Like, how do we make, uh, give an account, how does this square with this, this holy good being? Um, but there's a different kind of problem of evil, and I think it's the kind that you're, you're addressing, which uh, some people will call it emotional, some people call it a pastoral problem, some people call it an existential problem of evil, where like the, the person who's experiencing suffering or recently has or is reflecting on it, or their good friend or family member is experiencing intense suffering in some way, what do we say to them? Um, and in many respects, uh, I uh, oftentimes have to punt to the pastors that deal with this thing more more because it's it's I mean I'm I'm a philosopher I don't do pastoral counseling I'm sure everybody is grateful for that. Uh, that, they don't, <laughs> that they're not coming to me for pastoral counseling. Um, but So there are some things that can be said. Um, so the first is, uh, um, there's a, a book that I think is uh, really, really helpful on this. Uh, it's, it's written by um, uh, Feinberg, uh, and it's called The Many Faces of Evil. And the whole book is on the, what we've been, we've been talking about, but the last two chapters are really, really helpful on this, um, and on this more pastoral, pastoral side. So I, I think that's a, that's a really good, uh, good book. Um, but then uh, there's another book called um, Walking Through Twilight by Doug Groteis uh, that recently came out. It's much more recent. It's a very thin book. Uh, his wife was diagnosed with a rare form of uh, uh, um, dementia, basically, she came down with, um, and it's sort of his account of dealing with that, and it's, it's really, really helpful. But um, the thing I would, I would want to point out is that uh, when we look through Scripture, uh, the first thing to note is we shouldn't be surprised by evil. It, we see good... Uh, godly men and women suffer all throughout Scripture. And we, whenever we look and see the details and the context surrounding it, we can see uh, sometimes we can figure out that there are multiple reasons for why people... There, that um, Some people are experiencing suffering um, as a... And this is one I'm always most nervous about mentioning because people sometimes seem too quick to point that out in others. Um, but sometimes we experience evil and, and suffering as a punishment for wrongdoing, right? I mean... Read through the Old Testament. The Israelites were always experiencing suffering uh, because they were turning away from God. Uh, and so that's something we have to be open to. Is, that, is there sin in our life? Is there sin in my life? 
And that's what is leading me to experience this, this chastisement. Is God using, trying to use this as a, as a way to get me to turn back to him? Uh, other times, it, it's simply a way of, um, we, we may experience suffering as a way of identifying with more fully with Christ's own suffering and being able to recognize uh, the, the suffering that he experienced, uh, we too have experienced. Um, there, it can be uh, a part of our, our sanctification process um, that uh, God wants to give us an opportunity to respond to him more fully and more faithfully and more honestly. Um, and so uh, whenever you, you look through scripture and you see people who have suffered, um, sometimes it's punishment, other times it's not. Uh, and so um, the, the, the main thing is that we shouldn't be surprised by it. Um, other times, um, it's simply the, the, the working out of our own bad choices. Um, right? my, my father uh, was a paint contractor in the 70s when everything had asbestos. Uh, and then, so he was always breathing in asbestos and, you know, uh, uh, the paint has all the stuff, you know, the, what's, what's the stuff you're, you got to get out of the paint? Uh, lead? Lead, yeah, all the lead paint. Uh, and he smoked like three packs a day for about 40 years. Well, at some point he got cancer and he ended up dying. And do I think that early premature death is an evil? I absolutely do. But there's a good chance that that evil was caused by his own bad decisions, um, even though we would tell him all the time, stop smoking. Uh, and he didn't, right? And so, um, so there, it's hard to say without knowing the specific details. And what's really difficult about these situations is that sometimes even our closest friends and family members may not be able to help us figure out exactly what's happening. Uh, but I think we just need to recognize that it could be a lot of different, there could be different answers for each individual person's suffering. Um, and we, we may not be aware at the time. Uh, we may never become aware of why we've gone through something. Um, I, I think uh, it wouldn't surprise me at all if there are people who uh, even uh, uh, on, uh, you know, in eternity in heaven, they may still never know why they went through that particular evil. I don't think God owes us an explanation, um, though I think it, o over time, often what we learn in retrospect, I see what God was doing there. He was getting me ready for this, or he was preparing me for that, or I had sin in my life, and he was reaching out to me and using this as a way to get me to return to him. Uh, and so I think it could be a lot of different things, um, but you're cert it's certainly right, it's a difficult uh, issue, um, but if somebody's dealing with that, and that wasn't all that helpful, that's why I suggest not coming to me for pastoral counseling. Uh, but um, so I, I'm not sure what else to say say beyond that. But um, I do think that many times Christians have a false view or a false expectation that we won't experience it um, when we I, when biblically I have no reason at all to think we won't experience evil. So whenever it does happen, the, I think what's hard is to think I'm unique. I'm the only one who's. Why is God picking on me? Whenever in reality we all will experience it, and when we and we should expect to experience that when we live in a fallen world, we should expect to experience these kinds of things regularly. One of the things that Feinberg says in the chapter is he said, "I learned that it was okay to get really angry at sin." Like a friend emailed him and said, "You must be really mad at sin right now." And it wasn't that his wife sinned, right? When she got this this diagnosis, um, it wasn't that his wife sinned. It was that his wife was in the situation because sin entered the world, and he learned to get really angry at that, that that's the root cause. Um, and uh, I think there's something helpful to that, yeah, or something helpful about that. Yeah, I think uh, the Christian uh, narrative is suffering is a central piece, mm -hmm. and I think like what uh, triggered for me, coming back to the book, we'll come back to it, um, is... Uh, Ruse's almost allergic reaction to the cross, right? Mm, you know, yeah. he was like, I cannot accept that a God yeah. would demand blood, yeah, you know, and yeah. suffering yeah. to atone for, like, what kind of God right. does that? But I think the Christian message is unique in that I think suffering is allowed. I think it reminds us of our creature creatureliness. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it it's an opportunity for us to draw close to God. And I think one of the most powerful images uh, in the New Testament is in Revelation, mm. where everybody is around, surrounding the throne mm. of God, and mm. there's the Lamb upon the yeah. throne that's yeah. slain. Yeah. You know, the, the evidence yeah. of his suffering yeah. in, in, uh, in 
sympathy and empathy yeah. with with our, yeah. our creatureliness yeah. is there to be worshipped yeah. for all eternity. Like yeah. even though there are no tears in heaven, yeah. you know, there still is the evidence of suffering yeah. that yeah. Christ bore for us. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like it's yeah, a yeah. it's a very uh, yeah, I, interesting. I, I also think that suffering can give us uh, and uh, help us remember that, especially when you think of things like cancers or physical ailments that we have. You know, that that this is not our home. That this is not permanent. Right? You can give us uh, help us not get too comfortable in the here and now in this temporary fleeting time that we have that that we, we ought to be aiming and pointing and, and longing and striving for something beyond the here and now and sometimes whenever everything is really good in life you you know sometimes you'll hear missionaries talk about how it's really hard to go to affluent parts of the world or affluent parts of the country and preach the gospel because everybody's got everything what do i need jesus for life, life is great right and i think there's something to that um and so sometimes suffering can be a way of helping us remember this is temporary. There will be a time that we uh, are no more on this earth and that we need to be mindful of, of our ultimate uh, home. Does evil need a physical identity? Hmm. Or can it be a thought? Like, can yeah. it be, if you have good, yeah. if you have Christ, if you have yeah. heaven, yeah. does evil then need right. Satan, devil, and hell? Yeah. Or not. Um, well, I don't know that it needs Satan and the devil in hell. Um, and so here is where I think you're going to get different accounts. So on uh, the Paul Helm Augustinian sort of view, um, the answer is no, because it doesn't, it doesn't exist at all. Uh, it only exists whenever you take something that's supposed to be good and you remove some of that goodness there, right? So uh, whenever you have a man who uh, loses a leg, right? Uh, why do you say the loss of a leg is an evil? Well, because there's goodness that's missing there. He ought to have two functioning legs, and he only has one functioning leg, and so we say that's evil, because there's goodness there that has been removed, that's, that's absent. Um, and so in those view, those accounts, no. Um, others, others, I think what they would say, so one of the things that's interesting in the book um, is that in a lot of accounts, times whenever you read about the problem of evil, um, people will say, well, you, so you have Moral evil, uh, you know, murder, child abuse, those kinds of things. Um, evil that is the result of the intentional action of moral agents. And then you have natural evils, like the suffering that results from a hurricane or a tsunami or something to that effect. Um, one of the things that comes out in the book is that no one in the book talks about natural evil. Um, and uh, Roos intentionally says, I don't think that, that exists. I'm actually inclined to agree with him that there is no such thing as natural evil. I think there's suffering that results from natural events, but I don't think it's evil. I think evil just is a moral notion. And so if evil, uh, whatever you, if you go and read uh, philosophers who work on just the concept of evil itself that aren't worried about its relationship to theism or not, or the problem of evil, you're not, if you're not worried about any of that stuff, you just want to read what evil is, they always talk about evil in a moral way context. They, they just don't have room for a natural evil at all. And I'm, incl I'm actually starting to think, this is the one thing in my own view that did change, not result of the four authors, but just as I was working on the introduction to the book, is I'm now inclined to think that there isn't a, such a thing as natural evil. And so if, if we don't have natural evil, uh, we have, but we do have moral evil, well then I don't know that you have to have it existing as a thing. What instead you have are, uh, moral evil would amount to something like, um, it's multiply instantiated, meaning um, whenever someone is uh, suffering, we just call that so uh, a, a person is murdered. Well, the, the bringing about of that person's untimely death without justification, we just call that evil. What, what was the evil of it? Well, it's not a thing that exists. Instead, it's the, the choice that was made and uh, the choice was brought to fruition. It was carried out, right? So... Um, I would, I, I would be more inclined, like Augustine's probably right that evil doesn't exist all on its own, uh, but I don't know if that's super helpful in these sorts of contexts. What I'm inclined to think evil is something is that evil resides in an individual. It's, 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 uh, so, I mean, in other places, uh, Augustine does talk about uh, evil being or, or sinning or evil, so the, the turning away from God, whenever your will turns from God towards anything else, usually yourself, oneself, when you turn from God to oneself, uh, away from God, that that's an instance of evil. That's what causes this diminished goodness. And 
I think that part of Augustine is certainly right, where uh, e- evil is, becomes something that's sort of part of the individual choice that's made. Uh, now, there's, there would be gradations of evil, right? Some choices that we make are more evil than others. Uh, I, think, I think that's, uh, you know, um, uh, perfectly fine. Um, but I don't, I, that sort of an account, I don't know that you need, like, um, hell and Satan. And I think those are, uh, what we say about evil choices among human agents, we would just say also about non-human agents as well, like Satan and his cohort. Uh, and, um, yeah, I don't know if that is more confusing or helpful. I'm not sure. So, yeah. so for you, for you, <laughs> like, uh, the idea of a cosmic fall, are you kind yeah. of moving away from that kind of... No, I think it's, I think that would be a way of talking about, um, so whenever you have the cosmic fall, what I don't think you have is the creation of a thing called evil that sort of gets pervasive and spread around. Instead, instead I think what you have is um, an effect that has multiple uh, con- uh, consequences. consequences. Yeah. Um, and so I don't, um, yeah, I don't, I don't have a problem with a cosmic fall. I just don't think in the cosmic fall something is created that is so it's it's like um you, you might think of it as like uh, reality caught a disease of some sort like a, a, a disease of degradation or something or something like that or where um it's sort of eating at itself and that's what we call evil uh, but it's but ultimately it's um i so it's like be, an atrophication of reality or something, something to that effect yeah. yeah yeah something to that effect um i i don't think that evil just is a state of consciousness. I think it's brought about by conscious choices that people make. And so, um, so I don't think that um, the, the suffering one experiences uh, by having your arm chopped off in a car accident or something like that. I don't think that's just, like there's real pain going on there. I don't think that's just a state of consciousness that needs to be avoided. Uh, right, I think it's real. There's real suffering there, and um, there's real lack of goodness going on. Like your goodness is being removed, right? Uh, and so I think it's I think it's more than that. Um, but I I'm, I'm I I do think that um, I, I so sometimes whenever I think about the how we we approach evil, sometimes the the term gets is, is sort of a loaded term because it gets used in a lot of different ways. In a lot of different contexts, and um, so earlier I'd said I'm, I'm becoming more hesitant about thinking that there's a problem of natural evil, um, but I don't think that means that like Christians don't have to give an account of why people suffer and die as a result of tsunamis. Um, there's still some explanatory work that's got to go on there, and so sometimes I think it actually can be better to think about it not in terms of evil, but just in terms of suffering. Like, why is there suffering? And then it's harder to think of suffering just being instances of, like, uh, states of consciousness that need to, uh, you need to have to figure out, you know, what the explanation is for those states of consciousness. It's just, because suffering is something that's more easily, readily identified, right? The person undergoing torture, they're suffering there. And so why do those kinds of things occur? Um, and... Um, Sort of in line with uh, Davis's view, I, I'm going to say those kinds of things occur because there are conscious agents that have made choices to bring that about uh, without any overriding good. Right? It's not a doctor or something like that trying to save a life. Right? It's it's uh, the, the the intentional bringing about of harm uh, for its own sake, not not for the sake of anything better uh, or greater. Something along those lines. Okay, great. Well, uh, will you help me in thanking? Uh Dr. Franks, uh, (laughs) for coming out today.